Good afternoon and a very warm welcome. Thank you all for joining us for another segment of the Author Engage Coffee Room Series. I would like to begin today's session with some basic information to help us navigate this session. Firstly, it's my legal obligation to inform all our guests that the session will be recorded and we will be available live on Arthrex.com. In addition, this session will be broadcasted live on social media platforms such as YouTube.com. I would like to now take this opportunity to welcome our esteemed faculty. Once again, welcome back Prof. Nassif, a specialist foot and ankle surgeon from Cairo, Egypt. Prof. Nassif is not only an accomplished arthroscopist with an experience from all over the world, but a founding member of the Egyptian Foot and Ankle Society and an active member of organizations such as ESICOS, CECOT, and as well as the prestigious AFAS organization. Joining us today as a moderator for the session is Dr. Ursula Zanovich, a specialist knee and ankle surgeon and a scientific director from the Carolina Medical Center in Warsaw, Poland. She currently holds a post as a faculty member in the prestigious McGowan Institute for Regenerative Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. A warm welcome to both of you and thank you for joining us in light of our special circumstances that we face. Your support and contribution is highly appreciated. As you can see, folks, this is uh, one of many of our series in uh, the Author Engage Coffee Room series. And coming up next week, we have the evolution of ACL injuries on the 4th of May and preserve the meniscus in the following week on the 12th. So please join us for those. I'd also like to take this opportunity now to thank all our healthcare professionals from around the globe uh, helping us fight this COVID-19 crisis. We commend you and we support you. Thank you for your contribution. Before we get to the main event, I'd like to just cover some housekeeping rules. Please ensure that your microphones are muted at all times. This will create a calm atmosphere and cut out any background noise. In addition to that, we will have a Q&A session during this broadcast where those of you joining us from outside the Microsoft Teams network can send your questions to orthoengage at gmail.com. Once again, that's orthoengage at gmail.com. And for those of you joining us on the Microsoft Teams network, you can place your questions directly in the chat box. I would like to now hand over to our moderator for the session, Dr. Ursula, over to you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will give uh, the voice to my dearest friend, Professor Nasef, who is one of the best foot and ankle surgeons I know. And uh, we will share this session uh, discussing different cases from advanced ankle arthroscopy. And we all hope that you will all participate, asking questions, uh, sending it via email or putting on a chat box. Uh, so during the first presentation of Professor Nasef, um, I'll be checking frequently the question box and if necessary, I'll give this question to you, okay? And then we'll discuss. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ursula, for the very, very kind um, introduction. Uh, we both know that uh, you are uh, uh, an equally better, if not even better, uh, arthroscopist and ankle surgeon. Uh, so, um, oh, sorry. There you see, I just made the first mistake. Um, so today is, I'm sorry. Um, this was working fine. Okay. Yes. So today is actually part two of, is this screen showing fine? Yes. Yes, now it, it is. is. Okay. Yeah. So this is actually part two of ankle arthroscopy. We discussed part one, which was the ABCs of how to basically perform an ankle arthroscopy, whether it's from the anterior or posterior, or even from both sides. Today is going to be a small talk about, well, not really a small one, maybe within 15, 20 minutes, about what are the repair options that we have once we've gotten into the 
um, ankle with the arthroscopy. And we all know there are a lot of various pathologies that we can uh, tackle. Uh, these are my disclosures. I do have to um, submit them, of course, um, and they might have some relevance in some of the procedures or the tools or the instrumentations that I might be using um, within these um, talks. Now, um, I think the aim here is to quantify, at least generally, what are the different types of pathologies that can be treated arthroscopy in the ankle, and perhaps give some of the uh, examples. I will not get into the technical details much, you're all much learned than I am, of how to actually uh, diagnose these or how to um, uh, take the patient up until the procedure is going to be done. But uh, if there are some relevant uh, maybe tips, I will try and point them out. And of course, we will try and also highlight that uh, now that some of the more advanced procedures, perhaps in a sequential manner. And let's start off by um, ankle uh, anterior ankle arthroscopy. I will just reiterate what Dr. Ursula said. Uh, we, we, we call this the coffee room because we wanted it to be more interactive. It's like not just the uh, traditional format of a meeting where you would go and listen to someone just showing cases or, or, or putting up some slides. So I would urge each one and every one of you, if you do have questions, any technical tips, any things you want to ask about, we, uh, me and Ursula would be more than happy to try and tell you what we know about this. So let's get started. Uh, we, we can divide the pathologies that we will um, uh, encounter in the ankle into soft tissue and bony pathologies. Now, the soft tissue takes the normal um, um, pathological tree, the congenital rheumatic, but the more important Important ones are obviously the traumatic, the impingements, the sprains, the fractures, and what, what have you not. Of course, the degenerative, the primary and secondary osteoarthritis are also a big um, issue that you can discuss here. Also, the bony pathologies, these are the anterior bony tibiotalar impingement, the footballer's ankle, the osteochondral, the osteochondral lesions of the ankle, and of course, the ankle osteoarthrosis. But there are even more advanced procedures that you can uh, tackle with the uh, arthroscopy. These are the three most boring uh, slides, so bear with me. It gets a little bit more interesting interesting later on, is how you evaluate with the scope fractures, how you evaluate the syndesmosis. If you want to do a brostrum or a lateral collateral ligament of the ankle repair, maybe you can even think about doing a deltoid or maybe anterior ankle arthrodesis. So let's start off with the soft tissue, the impingement syndromes. We all know these are the sprains that will not go away. So a patient comes three months, some people even say six months down the line. And this has been described ever since 1943, was described as an athlete's ankle, maybe a football's ankle. And if you take these soft tissue first, and those that are anterior, because we are talking about anterior only, so they could be anterolateral impingement lesions, they could be medial impingement lesions, and they could also be syndesmotic soft tissue impingement lesions. Now, the anterolateral, and this is just quickly, these are the friction of the distal fascicle of the anterior inferior tibio, not talo, tibiofibular ligament, which was functionally called the Bassett's ligament. I do remember now my our good friend, deceased friend, um, may God rest his uh, soul, uh, Pau Golano, he, he has beautiful anatomical descriptions. Now, if you want to diagnose these, the dorsiflexion test is usually positive. What you should be looking for is the MRI. These are the most significant. And even specifically in the MRI, look at those axial T2 fat suppression images. They show you a lot of... Uh, um, uh, and they can show you where exactly that pathology is in the anterolateral gutter. Now, these could be just normal soft tissue or synovial impingements on the lateral side, but they could also be involving the actual ligament itself, where it could be the inferior fascicle, which would be rubbing across the Taylor dome there. You might even see some chondral lesions. And when you remove that, you see that it becomes a little bit more free. Now, I just put up this video because I think it was taken, this was one of my patients, I think, 10 years ago. And at that time, I remember the fellow there, when I started using the punch, he said, but Nasef, you're removing the AITFL itself. Now, look, we, we will discuss later on how to really know what it is you're removing. But what I would like you to see is there, you see, the AITFL is still intact. Now, when this procedure was first described, they, they had described that this was, wouldn't if you remove that, it would not add to the pathology, to the instability. We can discuss this a little bit later on in the discussion. Now, as opposed to it being mainly a ligamentous um, impingement or a tissue impingement on the lateral side. On the medial side, it's usually a fibrinous or a synovial impingement. And these are usually very apparent, and you can remove them simply by using a shaver or a whatever, what have you not, or a burr. You can also have syndesmotic soft tissue impingements. But also be aware of the plica, and we can differentiate between the plica and the normal AITFL. These are usually haphazard. They're not exactly 45 degrees from the tibia. It is, after all, called the tibiofibular. So these can range from anywhere to to anywhere in the ankle, and they usually more often than not click onto the talus and cause some debris, some um, uh, encroachment. You can have synovitis. You, 
which could be a part of the osteoarthritic process, but you can also have a synovial disease, such as a PVNS in this case, which if you imagine you wanted to do this open, you would have taken up a, a, a complete anterior ankle arthrotomy, whereas in this case, you could do it with simply removing the, um, uh, the diseased synovial tissue. But what about the bony pathological conditions? They could be anterior bony tibio-talar impingements, and we know that these were described early 50s. Now, these are um, uh, classically pain with dorsiflexion. They could be on both sides, not just on the lateral side. And usually the radiographs are very significant. You can see these. Uh, it's not a time for the theoretical discussion, but we could also discuss later on in the um, group discussion about the um, specific views for trying to take these out on, onto the x-rays. But you should also be aware of that this is not a part of the osteoarthritic process of the ankle because then your um, treatment with, or management would differ and it's not a part of a micro-instability which is now a big issue. We can discuss this a little bit later on. Sometimes this tibial osteophyte can cause a cartilage lesion on the tailored dome. This was also a patient that we had years back in our uh, and, and as you can see, there was this huge osteophyte, um, which according now to the more recent Italian literature is the um, focal, not focal, it's, it's, it's a wide lesion. So you can debride that. And that lesion by the progressive motion of ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion was that which was creating this chondral abrasion. Would you grade this as an arthritic ankle? In this case, we didn't even have the micro fracture tools at that time. So I decided to do this chondral picking. Now, I would love to see this patient now after 10, 12 years, but she doesn't, she doesn't want to get an... Uh, uh, arthroscopy procedure to be done for her to check the level of the cartilage. And this is not really apparent on the MRI. So this is where, where perhaps a nanoscope might come in. As for the arthroscopic burring down, I was taught that you can classically take it from down up where you look into the ankle, start at the ankle joint and go up. But I think it's better to take it actually from the upside down. So because we know that the uh, articular capsule it, it invaginates and it, it takes its origin from right above the um, traction spur. People call it a traction spur, but it's not actually a traction spur because it's not at the level of the capsular junction. And simultaneously or similarly for those that are on the talus, so this would be the talar articular surface, this would be looking at the, down towards um, distal, this would be superior and inferior, you should also burr these down. So you burr it from distal to proximal. That's the easy way to do these. Of course, moving forward, you can go to the osteo chondral lesions of the ankle joint. These can be chondral or osteochondritis desiccans, where you can just have a simple chondral lesion of the talus, or you can have a lesion involving also the subchondral bone. Now, this is also just a little theoretical point. It has been shown that the CT is possibly the modality of choice for known injuries. So you know the patient has a, you're not looking, you're not deciding, you're not going for a differential diagnosis. Then the CT would probably give you more information as how best to tackle these. Perhaps the CT and the MRI do have a similar accuracy, but some people, I am from that school, I prefer the CT for preoperative planning. And if I'm doing the CT, I want, and I, I think I can access it uh, arthroscopically, I would do this CT in plantar flexion view by Van Bergen and the group from Nick Van Dyke, because then they can show you, now this was a, a skeletally immature patient, as you can see there, so an osteotomy would be a big deal here. But if you do the plantar flexion x-ray uh, CT, then you know that you might be able to access that arthroscopically. Now, these can be just chondral lesions of the Taylor dome, as we said, but we can also, they, in some cases, the cartilage might be actually intact. And as you can see, this was also involving here in this particular case, it was also involving the shoulder. Now, the cartilage looks fine. It's pristine. I had no heart to remove that out. So I decided maybe I might do a retrograde um, drilling. And at that time, we did not have the GPS, the um, um this was also like maybe seven years ago. So we had to improvise. And what we did was we used an ACL guide. I actually tried to look for one that was flat. I tried not to injure the articular surface onto the tailor dome and underneath the tibia. And then I used one of the tref finds, the drills that the neurosurgeons use, the six, seven millimeter one. I wish I did have this. Of course, it would have made my life much easier because then I would have put it simply onto the um, um, patient in any position because this axis allows this limb and this limb to rotate in any direction you want so you can access it. And then we did a retrograde drilling. We took out the bone. We packed it back in again. And fortunately, I think this patient, I have seven years follow-up and it was fine. Now, this is an interesting case again. This is was a 23-year-old female executive secretary, if you know what that means. But the more importantly in our country, she was a squash player. And we Egyptians, we're not good at many things, but we're really very good at squash. And she was actually a world champion. Now, she came in 
in with this. It didn't really prevent her from playing, but she couldn't perform up to her own standards. Now, remember, this was, I think now she's 30. Yes, this was seven years ago, or maybe even more, because, yes, we did not have the microfracture tools, as you will see. And what I opted for doing at that time, it was a six millimeter um a defect, and I did a drilling. As you can see here, when we will debate this, this was years ago, we were doing it with a KY. I did not have the microfracture tools, which we now have handy due to the industry uh, in our hands. And then I let the tourniquet down, and I decided that if there was good enough bleeding. And she's been performing. She actually won two world champions later on. I don't think it's because of my work, but I think that she had good healing potential. I would have loved, as I said, to see these patients now. They like walk into the clinic, because you're offering them a diagnostic procedure that you can use in the clinic, like using the nanoscope, as opposed to a full-blown arthroscopy, just to check the level of the fibrocartilage that would have been um, um, developed here down the line. Of course, going on to the osteochondral grafting options you have, you can do these arthroscopic or open. We could use, of course, autografts or allografts. We do not have allografts in our country. But I think the lesion now, people are talking, there have been systematic reviews, they're discussing this 15 millimeter lesion or 10 millimeter in the area. But also I think what factors a lot is the depth of the lesion, if it's less than or more than a centimeter. This would give you an idea if you can use it um, open or not, or if you can do the grafting or not. This was a case of an arthroscopic mosaic plus. As you can see, I first, I had the traction on. I didn't use it except if I, when I knew I could access it. And then when I did know I, I could access it, I then put the traction. And as you can see, I debrided the lesion, removed the soft tissue off. I, I, I quantified the measure. I even used the normal gauge, depth gauge, you know, the level that I needed. I went back up arthroscopically to the knee. I took my graft from um, the knee. Um, and in this case, I think it was a 12 millimeter um, uh, uh, graft, which was taken uh, from the knee. Yes, there. And then I went back to the um, ankle and I simply just um, plugged it back into place. So this is bone with articular cartilage. This is also open for discussion. We know that the articular cartilage of the um, uh, car of the ankle is two millimeters as opposed to the that of the knee, which is six millimeters. Even I think I did a technical mistake here that it was a little bit depressed than I would normally like it to be. But anyway, these are the simple classic uh, anterior arthroscopic procedures. We might have some uh, arthroscopic procedures, which are even more advanced than that, like the anterior ankle arthrodesis. I do know that Dr. Ursula has a magnificent case, so I'm not going to discuss that. We can also use them on fractures, on syndesmosis or prostrum. So I'll quickly run through. This was a case, as you can see, it was fairly recent. Something told me that, in, in that at that time in the ER, we did not have the CT. We could not do it. I do not remember quite why, but something told me, I want to use a scope on this patient just to make sure the syndesmosis is fine. I'm happy I did that decision because, look, there you can see, even though it looks rather benign, you do have a fracture here. You'd think there's no syndesmotic injury there, but that was the syndesmosis pre the uh, fixation. And then I went on and fixed it using a tightrope. I think I would not have done that if I had just done the open, simple medial incision and lateral incision for the fibula. You can also use it, of course, to, and I think this is one of the most important factors that the, the scope is, is, is helping us in, is to evaluate that lateral, lateral ligament. This was a patient that was actually sent to me because of an osteophyte, an anterior osteophyte. They did complain of some instability. Now, I decided to scope these anterior osteophytes, um, this patient, um, first, and because I know that she did have um, some instability, she was complaining of instability. And as you can see there, yes, that's the osteophyte, more on the lateral side. That also should give you an indication that it might be an instability. Now, if you've seen a lot of these normally and you look in, you can't really see all this except if something is off that fibula. And if you see the space there, you can see the um, the AT, the, the talo uh, fibular ligament is off the fibula, even though some of it is still attaching. So that's what's now, I think, thanks to Jordi and his group, Jordi Vega, is a micro instability. And so I decided, no, I should not just remove the osteophyte. And I went ahead and did a knotless suture fixation um, to, uh, for that uh, patient. Microscopion helped me, of course, we can discuss, you can use lassos, you can use whatever type of instrumentation. In this case, I just felt it was easier for me to just one punch and go. I took out the suture and then I fixed it and tested the stability um, um, later on. So this patient actually, she was coming thinking that she was just going to have the, the osteophyte removed. I consented her because she ended up not returning to sports for three months. So that is something you should also take into consideration later on.
So all of these were just the anterior procedures. Um, we can move on to posterior. Uh, Ursula, would you like me to continue on with posterior, or should uh, we take a few questions? As maybe you? maybe we'll try to uh, encourage end. everybody to discuss. Uh, okay. So we have all those uh, anterior uh, compartment cases. Uh, if you guys have a question, please put it on a chat box or send it via to Michael, who is going to send it to me. Um, I have a question in the meantime. Uh, sure. you, know, you know, we discussed a lot this uh, shaving of the anterior inferior tibial fibular ligament. And to be honest, I hate it because I think that it gets in the conflict because there is instability. So you have anterior subluxation of the, of the talus. So tell me, if you do this, do you also stabilize the ankle or what's your approach to that? Uh, no, actually, I do not believe. Um, I think it is as it is called. It's an impingement uh, in the ankle. I take off only what is necessary to have the ankle not to, um, um, fricked, fricked, no, there is no friction between it and the anterior inferior tibial femur. I, I, I would be honest, um, uh, years back, I think maybe 20, 15 years back, I used to shave the whole thing off. That's the way I was taught. That's the way, uh, yes, uh, that's the way. It seemed, I don't know, the way to do it at the time. But since then, I have taken a step backwards. I have only removed what is necessary, and I do range that ankle through the range of motion under the anesthesia, whatever the type of anesthesia, and make sure that I do not have an instability. I know it has been discussed and there have been some cadaveric biomechanical studies that have shown if you remove the anterior inferior tibial fibular, you theoretically should not have um, uh, 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 an instability. But once again, these studies were done on cadavers. They were done in unidirectional motion, and we all know that the ankle sustains the injury rotatory. And I do not believe that you can measure that adequately in the lab and tell me that that is not um, uh, participating in stability. So no, short answer, I do not remove the ITFL anymore. Okay, we have a question. We have some questions from the floor. So first question, um, do you use always the Scorpio clamp to repair ATFL? Do Which you use Scorpion, Scorpion clamp? Oh, yes, the mini Scorpion. No, no, uh, because uh, uh, even though it's a very nifty uh, instrument, I mean, here it looks very nice and it was easy, but um, the, the mini Scorpion, even though it's mini, it does have some surface area and it does have some, uh, some width. So if the tissue, like in this case, is really nice and I know I can grab it and I can introduce the mini Scorpion without doing added damage, I would use it because it's one shot. You, you only get that because you bite it and you shoot it at the same time. But if I have a fear that the tissue is not good, and I'll tell you a little trick I do. I, I didn't show it, but I take a suture. I just pass a lasso suture, and I hold the ankle off the table through that ATFL. If it holds, then it tells me that that tissue is good. And then I can actually, I know it's, 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 it's robust. So I can repair it because more than often than not, this was a micro instability case. But if there are chronic ankle instabilities, the tissue is not that good. So I have no method of knowing is the tissue good enough. It looks fine under the arthroscopy, but maybe it's not going to hold with the sutures. So I hold it with that suture. If it's fine, then I use um, I use it. But more often, I'm now using lassos, the banana lassos, or lassos to to relay the sutures through. Yes. Okay, next question. Uh, what is your post-operative management after microfracture? Oh, okay. Um, uh, they are usually, they have to do range of motion from the get-go. So I do not put them in a slab or in a, in a walking boot, except for pain. They do range of motion, so I get to mold that um, blood clot, if you will, or, or um, uh, the fluid, the, the PRP, the growth factors that are coming out. They do not wait bare. At first, I was very stringent with the six-week protocol, and then the guys from the knees and some other studies came up, I think, from the Stedman Clinic, and they showed us that if you wait pair these patients at even four weeks or three weeks, not so much damage happens. And so I've started to become more lenient, and I've Everything we do in orthopedics is six weeks. So a fracture heals in six weeks, a suture heals in six weeks. So I think it's it's usually the line that I would not go beyond. But now I have become more and more, um, especially with the newer microfracture uh, tools, I go now to um, to four weeks, not weight-bearing. Then four weeks, weight-bearing, and a walking boot. 
Uh, but sports is definitely off for, uh, I'm, I'm rather cautious for at least the 12 week mark. Okay. And now my favorite question. I would like to ask my question from previous webinar. How do you assess the smotic reduction arthroscopically? Is it possible <laughs> to see the fibula sitting in the incisura correctly via arthroscope? No, you're right. Um, I know we've discussed this a lot, and maybe this is um, well. The guys from the guys from um, uh, uh, Cristio Giovanni's group in Harvard, they have these instrumentations. We don't. I don't have that, but I'm just telling you as a, a, a in theory, they have devised these nice tools that you can insert into. They have like two millimeter, three millimeter, four millimeter, six millimeter that you can insert into the um, fibula, uh, the incisura, and decide if there is a syndesmosis or not. Um, to be honest, what do I do practically at the end of the day in my OR? As I told you before, I drape the other side and I use a mortise tibiofibular overlap view for the normal side and I compare that to the side I am operating upon, even for my open cases. And I also use the lateral view where I look at the posterior, the line along the posterior cortex of the fibula to try and get that two, um, two view uh, gauging of these uh, syndesmoses. Another thing, if you are doing it arthroscopically or you decide to put in um, a, a scope, the injury is there, you can see it. Uh, I know this is all feeling and gut instinct, but you know how the, from the numerous scopes you've done, how the syndesmoses looks like normally. When it is stretched or torn and you see all these fraying tissues coming down, I have a very low sh threshold to even think about um, not fixing it. So I would rather fix it than leave it um, non-fixed, if you will. Okay, so basically you are checking it out with C-arm. <laughs> yes, um, uh, I know that people from uh, the group of, of, of uh, the, the also an American group, I, can't, I think Louisiana or Pittsburgh, actually Pittsburgh, I think, they're doing these weight-bearing CTs pre-op. Um, and I nice. think it's going to be, yes, it's going to be, it's nice, but we are both, we are from a uh, poor country. We still don't have that. So we have to make do with what we have now. No, uh, okay. we, we don't have that luxury yet. Okay. So uh, let's move to the next, uh, last sure. two questions. Uh, dear professor, what is your approach in Oston? osteochondrosis the second cases when the lesion is situated on the corner of the talus? Ah, yes. So, um, uh, uh, of course, this is a very good question because the, one of the three main factors, I think, in dealing with OCDs or OCLs are the depth, the, um, the size, the surface area of the lesion, and containment. Now, containment is where you have that normal shoulder that you have that can contain any bone plug or uh, any bone um, grafting or osteochondral plug you're going to be putting in. If the shoulder is non-contained, so if I do not have a shoulder as on the medial side or maybe very rarely on the lateral side, I would rather, and if it's less than 10 millimeters in diameter, I would microfracture it only, but I would tell the patient that um, from we know from literature that this might not be 100%. It's actually more an 85 to 88% success rate. So if there is still another option, uh, they might need another uh, surgery. Now, um, if the patient um, uh, lesion is more than that, I have two options for that. I either try to place um, an, uh, an, uh, an uh, mosaic plasty where I know that I will be seeing bone for a few millimeters above the shoulder, it depends here again on the depth. So if I have more than five millimeters above, below the surface, just on the side, then I can put in, and I will depend on that five to six millimeters in the depth of the lesion holding it. Um, if not, I use uh, bone grafting and impaction bone grafting. In this case, I do it open and I take a reverse periosteal flap. So I take a periosteal flap off of the medium layer osteotomy, and I reverse it so the cambium layer is the one that is on the superior surface because we know these are the ones that might regenerate fibroblasts or cartilage cells, and I put it with a little bit of fiber and glue onto, and then mold that periosteum onto the side. I hope I answered the question. Okay, and the last question, and we move to the posterior compartment. Uh, what about C-Guide, like instrument, used for retrograde drilling for OCD? Which company yes. <laughs> and adjust for how much degree of angle? 
Okay. <laughs> of course, now we're going to be uh, advertising, <laughs> but um, I am an RFX consultant, but the one I use is the GPS. I'm not sure that others have. The GPS um, RFX guide, it's, it, I, I, I love it so much. It's Ever since I've had it, now it's in my it's my toolbox. I use it for a lot of things, and you'll be amazed how easy it makes your life. Because as I showed in the, in the, um, in the photograph, you have this bijunctional um, a socket. So one arm can move in this direction, the other arm or C can move in the opposite direction. You can put it at whatever angle you can. The angle that is necessary to get the job done. Usually if you're using uniplanar guides, we used to use the ACL guides, the flat ones from the, the knee guides. Um, we couldn't get except a certain angle and in only one plane. Now, when you have these biplanar or even multiplanar devices, you can then toggle it and twist it around the foot because it has such versatility that you can get exactly where you want to go. So the angle is not a specific thing like when you're drilling for an ACL and people would use, I think, the 55 mark or something like that. In the, in the talus, because it has such a wide surface and you're looking to exactly target the point, then you would rather use the point that leads you, the, the angle, sorry, that leads you to that. And that's why it's not even uh, exactly marked. Okay, I think uh, we'll move. Hitler, yeah. If, sorry, if I can jump in, yeah, I've just received one question from uh, the email. So, Dr. Nassif, this is to you. It's from a friend of yours from South Africa. You may recognize Dr. McIntyre. Oh, yeah. Um, Hello, Kevin. <laughs> he's asking, uh, could you precisely describe your portal positions and modifications for your arthroscopic uh, modified brostrum technique? Uh, okay. And then any tips for surgeons starting out with this procedure? Uh, that is going to be a rather long answer, Kevin, but I will try to do my best. Well, basically, as you saw, because I use a knotless system, I do not need except two and an accessory lateral. All right. So what I would do is the two, um, the two, the two normal um, portals, the anteromedial and the anterolateral. But in this case, I take my anterolateral portal more laterally. So in classic arthroscopy, you would try and put, position it medially to the to the uh, lateral cutaneous branch of the of the nerve uh, of the perineal nerve, so the superficial perineal nerve, because when you dorsiflex, then the nerve comes laterally. But in this case, I would rather take it more lateral because I want to see end on onto the gutter. And I also want to tilt the scope from up down to look at the amount of tissue I have. Now, if you if you want to grab that tissue, I would then go down from the tip of the fibula two um, centimeters and one centimeter just indirectly um, lateral to the fibula, and I would then grab the tissue from that accessory um, portal. So I would be viewing from the anterolateral border and using the uh, inferior accessory anterolateral border for the uh, manipulation of the tissue. It's easier than keeping the scope on the medial um, side. Um, that is if you're doing it this way. A lot of other um, authors have described different other different methods, um, but I don't think that would be in the scope of this um, of, of time. But I promise you, I'll answer you more elaborately, Kevin, and anyone else who wants to to get the answer to that. Okay, so uh, let's move to the cases for the posterior compartment. I'm sure. encouraging everybody to put your questions in the chat box, and I promise I, I'm going to read it at the end, so we'll discuss it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ursula, just one comment on that. Dr. Nassif alluded to uh, the measurement probes or the sizing probes for the syndesmosis uh, assessment arthroscopically. Just to give you and everyone listening uh, a heads up, Arthrex is coming out with a set of probes, as you can imagine. So stay tuned for that and uh, speak to your Arthrex consultant. In the I knew you guys would do that. Short period. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So um, moving on to uh, posterior ankle arthroscopy, as uh, Dr. Ursula said, she has even much more interesting cases. So stay tuned for these. I tried to keep these as simple as I could. Of course, she always has better cases. But anyway, uh, you can Mom. keep the posterior ankle uh, pathology into not like soft tissue and bony because this is mainly an endoscopy as opposed to an arthroscopy on the posterior side of the ankle into articular and periarticular. So those involving the ankle, the subtalar joint, 
uh, or periarticular involving the tendons and the tissues that are in and around the posterior aspect of the ankle, the FHL, the posterior perineal, the Achilles itself, of course, and the bursa. Well, these are the classical indications, and we'll get into a little bit more of the advance later on. I do strongly recommend, and I, I am a f large fan of this particular slide, just because of this um, um, word here. This is, it's a systematic procedure. Doing the posterior ankle arthroscopy, in, in, not in my hands, but I believe, is one of the most easiest procedures if you do it systematically, if you keep up with those systematic um, steps. As we saw in the ABCs, this would be the backside of your, the posterior aspect of your talus, the calcaneus. This would be your FHL, and that would be the subtalar. The ankle joint would be here. So this is your working portal, because anything medial to that would involve the neurovascular structure is the nerve and the artery. And of course, you do not want to go there. So you should want to stay lateral to the FHL and not venture medial to that. But to do that, you have to find the FHL first. Now, this is why I brought up this slide, because I think it shows a video from A to Z. It is trimmed, but it's actually maybe half of what the actual procedure was. Now, when I take the scope back, I actually use the, um, uh, as you can see, a separator, because I do not like to remove just go in with a shaver and start shaving the tissues off the posterior aspect of the ankle because I believe that leads to a lot of uh, arthrofibrosis later on and these patients are more stiffer than they usually should be. Um, I'm sorry, is the video playing properly because it seems... It's, it's pretty slow. Yes, I had that idea also. Okay, anyway, um, let me just try that again. Okay, is it a little better? Maybe. Anyway, so I, I use a um, separator to gauge where I want to be. So this is at the posterior. If you notice, this is an important part here. The scope is always looking laterally. I always keep the scope and my instrument starting from lateral. Now, after I have taken if a little bit of the rongier and canal ligaments, I make a little working space, working portal, introductory portal there, and then boom, I just put my scope in closer to the bone as you will see in just a second here. And there, you see this immediately. You see the subtalar joint down beneath. This is looking laterally. As you can see, the scope is still looking laterally. I'm not sure if my pointer is showing there. And on the other side um, is medial. This would be on the um, other side. Now, why is that? Because I want to work from here to the other side. Uh, I think it also jumped. Anyway, I just move with the probe till I can see the FHL. Um, I think this video is also playing a little bit um, slow, right? But this is an important part. I, I think if you do not mind, I will just show it again because it's the way I, yes, you see, I move the probe on the talus there and then I can see the FHL. So I haven't done any motion as opposed to Dr. Osa. I know she likes to find the FHL a little bit higher, but I like it here because this is where I'm sure it will be. I move a long bone. It's easier as a tactile sensation to move across bone. And then when you just come to here, I know that I am safe. I redirect my shaver towards the lateral side. As you can see, the opening is looking laterally. And then I use the suction. And I just left this here to show you that the suction power of these shavers, especially as we use a 4.0 shaver, is really strong. So you can suction in some of these tissues into the shaver. So that would not be a very good idea. And then you can proceed on. You, sh you shave off a lot. And then, as you can see, in this case, this was an ostrigonium. Um, I'm not sure if it's showing um, properly, but you can see the subtalar joint. Uh, yes, there underneath, you can see from the lateral to the medial side. This is the line of demarcation of where the ostrigonium should be taken off. If you take the scope out and then proceed again from above it. Um, I don't know. It's really going very slow. I, I have no idea why. But anyway, this would be the ankle joint, and you can play with the dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of the ankle, and then you can see the ankle joint opening up. Because I'm only doing an ostrigonium, I do not want to remove the posterior tibiofibular ligament in this case, so I'm not really interested in removing and seeing the ankle joint as it should be. I think the video is not really playing properly. Um... Anyway, we, we go back, we've seen the FHL, we know the musculotendinous junction is always at the ankle joint. Then I know the tissue or the bone that I want to remove. And then I have some, um, you can actually use the scope and look into the FHL, as you can see there, as if it's a type of tendinoscopy. Um, it's, it's still very slow, right, Ursula? Uh, yes, it is. Oh, uh, pity. Okay. 
anyway, um, then I have some instruments, a few instruments that I usually um, like. Um, there you can see this um, curved um, osteotome or this curved, uh, some people use a freer elevator. And I go exactly to the line of demarcation and I just uh, separate it from the soft tissue there. I also have a few um, knives and then you can use any grasper. And if you see, if you debride it easily and properly, you can actually remove it almost in total this one piece and of course you would have to um, enlarge the skin incision a little bit of course to take this um, large piece of bone out um, and then at the end of the procedure if you still think that your FHL still has some uh, synovitis or some tissue um, around it then you can go back and debrief that so let's move on from that so that would be the pre-op and that would be the post-op um, as regards the um, x-rays. As I said, you can also get some FHL tenosynovitis. In this case, it will be uh, obvious, of course, by clinical diagnosis, but also on the MRI where you have a fluid, a lot of fluid, without the ostrigonum or the bony edema. So you know that in this case, you do not want to play around with the bone. You just want to remove the soft tissue. It's very, very obvious, of course, on the axial images also. And But as we know, that the fluid in and around the tendon can be normal. So how do I know that this is abnormal? Well, first of all, of course, the clinical examination. But what is also very important is that, and I've been taught this by one of my radiological colleagues, is that the fluid in and around any tendon, especially the posterior part of the ankle joint, should be more than what you see normally in the ankle. Then you know there's a pathology there. And if, of course, you see also bone edema, then you know that this is not only an FHL tenosynovitis, but it's also an osteogonium you might want to remove, as you can see there. So anyway, this would be the pictures. And in this case, you would want to release the flexor retinectum. It's a bit like trigger finger in the finger where, or in the hand surgeons where you want to release the um, flexor retinaculum and release that FHL tendon and make it free. Now, this was an interesting case. It was actually a son of a doctor, um, a uh, friend of mine, an oncologist, and he had a lot of popping. He was involved in this recent sport, the monofilament. So they do a lot of plantar flexion. And his his MRIs, I didn't put them up here, but they said that he was normal. He just had a flu, flu, uh, some fluid around the FHL. I did a posterior arthroscopy. This was six months after his, his, his non-stopping uh, complaints and we found a double belly of the FHL as you can see there. It's a rare anomaly but it happens and you had to release them both. So that was the initial FHL tendon and the double muscular belly of the FHL right down into the um, FHL tunnel. Of course you can also do OCDs from the posterior part if they are in the posterior teodome or in the tibial platform. In this case of course a plantar flexion CT would not suffice. You would actually might think about doing it in dorsiflexion. But this is the arthroscopic view you might see and in this particular case non-contained on the posterior aspect um, uh, uh, of, your, of a left ankle. I did a microfracture in that case. This was another larger one. It was not accessible anteriorly. It looked to be more accessible posteriorly. So I went in posteriorly and I also did a microfracture for that. In some cases, I think Ursula has an even better case of the tibia, but in some cases you might find the lesion on the tibia and you can access this uh, perfectly from the back and microfracture also that. Um, in other uh, pathologies, of course, the um, haglins or the calcaneoplasty, this is just to show you that in the exostosis, the shaver itself can remove the bone quite adequately. This is to show you, these are videos that we took and I'll show you how many years ago. This shows you how how far down actually the Achilles does insert because some people are afraid of disinserting the Achilles tendon. And of course, this is to show you that you should do this from both sides, through from the posterior lateral border and the anterior lateral border to be sure that you removed enough. And now I'm going to look like I'm a very old person because this was a technique we described with Yarosh, a good friend of mine. And this was 17 years ago. I can't believe how time has flight. But anyway, that was that at then. And uh, to be honest, I have, I think, taken a step back now from doing these endoscopically because I do believe some sort of pathology has to be treated on. These are for very strict indications. We might discuss this later on. Now, remember this slide where I said you should not move to the medial side? Well, maybe sometimes you would want to go to the medial side. And I'll show you these two cases where you might think about going medial. Of course, as a word of caution, this is for people who are experienced with posterior arthroscopy or have at least done a few cases before they venture. It's, of course, the C-Dell fracture, which is a rare external rotation, whether in pronation or supination. 
And you can have an avulsion of a deep deltoid. Now, what you would have is that the clinic, the patient would have a little bit of mild swelling on the posterior aspect. They're usually treated as if they are medial sprains. And if you look, their x-rays would be negative. But if you do a CT on these patients and you have a clinical suspicion, you will find that flake on the posterior medial malleolus there. Now, you can get these arthroscopically if you want, because these CDL fractures are right Basically, that's where they are, but they are medial to the FHL. And especially if you're going to use a punch to remove it, I think you should be very careful. You have to first see the um, neurovascular structures before grasping it or taking it out. Another uh, uh, area where you might venture medially is with tarsal tunnel syndrome. So on the CT, I thought that this was very accessible. It was very near to the FHL. So I thought I could get this arthroscopically. And as you can see when I'm probing there, it was a ganglion that was right uh, encroached on the nerve. That's the nerve, that's the tendon there. And I removed it uh, rather too aggressively, I might say, because then it just looked like the tendon was lying alone. Uh, but thankfully, the symptoms all went away um, and arthroscopically. Of course, you can also use the FHL transfer. Uh, this has been classically described for chronic cases of Achilles tendinosis where you have more than five millimeters, uh, five centimeters of a gap. And it's a very easy procedure for those who do it arthroscopically. It basically involves cutting the FHL tendon through the same portals, drilling the line to end the tunnel, and then sticking the tendon in and, and, and fixing it with an interference screws. But uh, over the past, I think now it's five years, I've been doing these more and more, and this is a big discussion later on. It's very controversial. I've been doing them now for acute cases. And I'm happy to report that this has just recently in 2000, this is actually the article in press. It has been um, accepted in the JFAS, and these are the cases, these are a few uh, from the actual article that will show the um, tendon, how very far posterior. These were all acute ruptures of the Achilles, and look at how uh, marvelously they have regenerated, actually, and look at how black they are on the T1. Anyway, but that's for discussion later on. So these were the classical indications, and the more advanced are the FHL, the Taylor body cyst, calcaneal cysts. I know Dr. Ursula has a few very nice cases she's going to show us. And of course, don't forget that there might be some anatomical variations of the FHL. So in conclusion, and I'm sorry I did take up some time, the arthroscopic methods of management, they are really very successful in treatment of various pathologies. And I remember when I was visiting Rick Furco years back, he said that the introduction of the arthroscope into the joint has shown us a lot more than we knew was there. Adequate knowledge of arthroscopic anatomy is vital. Some procedures would require more arthroscopic skills, obviously, than others. And definitely, we need to train and practice on specific procedures, on categories and in labs before we venture on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so we'll proceed to questions. Um, so everybody, you're welcome to put your questions in the chat box or to send it via email. Um, first question is from me. Um, Haglund deformation it yeah. might be associated with partial Achilles tendon rupture. So uh, how far, I mean, when would you decide to do it only endoscopically and when would you do more? Yes, that is a very good question, and that is why I have uh, since then um, reduced the amount of arthroscopic pure Haglund's resections that I do now. Um, uh, first of all, let's just get one thing clear, because personally, um, um, I think it's, it's an important aspect to discuss. If you know the Zadek osteotomy, now they treat even insertional Achilles degenerative uh, tears by just reducing the load and the line of tension of the pull on the Achilles. They do not even touch the Achilles tendon. They do not even touch the bursa. They do not even touch the osteophyte itself. And to be honest, I was very skeptical of these procedures. And then I started doing a few of these, and I noticed enormous re relief in patients. The x-rays, you have to coach the patients and tell them that you will still be seeing this bump at the posterior part of your x-ray, but your foot is going to get smaller and the, 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 the heel is going to be um, uh, less irritant and you're not going to have pain. So that kind of swayed me a little when I'm doing now the Achilles bursectomy or the exostectomy, removing the bone and the bursa, if my, these are just my indications, if the patient's degeneration on the MRI involves less than 20% of the Achilles tendon, and clinically, if the patient has pain on either side of the bone of the hagland, 
but not on the midline, not at the insertion of the Achilles. And these patients, they do signify where their pain is. Then in these patients, I would maybe be um, more prone to remove just the bursa or maybe do a Zadek. Now, if the insertional Achilles, exactly the pain is tender at the point of insertion, if the MRI shows me degeneration for more than two, three centimeters above the insertion and more than uh, 20 to 25 percent of the Achilles, I'm not too happy leaving it and not too happy leaving that degeneration. I take it out and I reinsert either using a speed bridge or um, a reinsertion of the Achilles. So I'm very aggressive with these um, uh, as opposed to the others. I know you might have a different point of view, but I think we can discuss that also. No, we more or less agree on that one. Okay, good. Okay. We agree. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, yeah, if not, because we are a little bit late on time, uh, so maybe we'll move to my cases. I have some yes, anterior yes. and posterior cases, and if action pops up, so sure. please read it. Okay. So I'll try to share my screen. Uh, Mike, do you have any questions via email? No, nothing from my side. Thanks, Ursula. I think we can carry on. And uh, if anything pops up, I will let you know. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just let me... Okay, guys. Sure. So while Dr. Ursula is getting the presentation ready, um, I would urge you, I mean, we, we said this is a coffee room, so don't be shy. We're here for you. Ask any questions you have, and we'll try our best to answer as much as we can. And stay tuned, because uh, Dr. Oswald has some really nice cases. Mm, right now, fighting with technology. <laughs> give me a second. I don't know what's going on. Mm. Uh, let me leave you. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I might have it. Well, I think I have to shut down the um, MS Teams and join you again because it kind of sucks. I don't know. Sorry. So I'll be back. Okay. 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 Started to work. Got scared. Okay. Yes. Perfect, Ursula. I think you're on there. Okay. Great. Can you can you see the presentation? Yes. Now you can. Go to slideshow. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I'm oh, so sorry. Keep on talking, do something. <laughs> I'm, I'm all excited waiting for your cases. <laughs> okay, it's okay. working. Can you see it? Yes, okay. perfect. Go ahead, Ellis. So. Uh, first case, um, it's a soft tissue conflict, but it's pretty complex, so I thought it would fit to, to this coffee room. 22-year-old uh, professional football player, he had multiple ankle sprains in the past. Uh, over the last three months, he started to have chronic pain in all compartments, anterior, medial, and lateral. And due to this pain, he couldn't continue trainings, but he also says he cannot afford to have a longer break. On clinical examination, he was unstable uh, as far as ATFL and C CFL are concerned. Um, he had pain on palpation in anterior, lateral, and medial compartment. Uh, these are his x-rays. Uh, we can see a uh, huge, uh, let me, this is this one, no. this one, okay. Okay, so we can see huge osteophyte. This is the AMI view, special view for um, anterior medial impingement. Uh, we can see some calcification on the medial side, so typical view for uh, someone who is chronically unstable. Uh, so we started to discuss it and we started to talk what to do. Uh, recommend him stop playing soccer, probably not not very smart idea, he would just disappear. Arthroscopy only or arthroscopy combined with lateral ankle stabilization. So we discussed it a lot as, as I thought, okay, he has which is the direct cause of his pain right now, but it all started with the lateral. Uh, so maybe if I do not fix it, the problem will come back, and I have no—I uh, have no idea what uh, for how enough. 
Uh, anyway, only for you to do arthroscopy. I'm aware that I will still have lateral ankle instability. So this is what I did. Uh, so this is his left ankle. We are looking at the lateral, uh, anterior lateral compartment. So you can see this is the, the fibula uh, and the ATFL is supposed to be somewhere here. There's nothing here. There's chronic inflammation. So I, I, I shaved it. Uh, then I went to the anterior compartment and surprisingly there was a huge, massive osteophyte, much bigger than I expected, uh, which also was a source of pain. So I shaved it as well. And then when I moved to the medial compartment, this is something you nicely um, were discussing just previously. So we can see that the deep layer of deltoid ligament is kind of flipped in between the medial malose and the talus. And in my experience, a lot of patients, they complain of a chronic uh, medial ankle pain after regular uh, lateral ankle sprain. And in many of those cases, in the ultrasound on the medial compartment, there's nothing special. You can see some scarring within the deltoid ligament. And it's really hard to visualize it, that type of um, conflict. But it can be there. So when, when you put a scope in, you can see it, you can shave it, and it shouldn't cause uh, much uh, instability. Uh, so this patient, uh, after this uh, after this surgery, he was fine. Uh, he said, okay, I'll come back to you in a couple of months to do lateral ankle stabilization. Uh, but he's coming back like once a year and it's been four years right now he still is unstable but he has no complaints and no pain so this is this is the way it is however in my opinion a little risky as all those conflicts come from instability at the first place and uh, next case uh, pretty complex case as well 27 year old uh, male uh, he had a calcanal fracture four years previously. A uh, couple of months after the uh, fracture, he started to have chronic pain in the lateral compartment. Uh, when he came to me, this is his x-ray. You can see there is a uh, bony conflict in the lateral compartment. This is his MRI, and you can also see that there is some edema in the bone. So subtalar joint is degenerative, and probably it can be uh, soon another source of pain. And this is his CT scan, and you can see what type of calcaneal fracture that he had. And the part of the calcaneus shifted laterally, and this is where the conflict started. So when I started to discuss it with him, I said, look, uh, of course, right now you just have this conflict um, below the lateral malose, but you started to have already degenerative changes in the subtalar joint. Uh, the alignment of the, of the hind foot is, is not proper. Uh, part of the calcaneus is shifted. So in my opinion, we should do everything. But he said, no, I, I just want to have this, this little spot below the lateral malleus removed. So I did arthroscopy. Uh, this is the uh, lateral malleus. This is the ATFL. And I managed to come underneath the ATFL and shaved all the uh, osteophytes he had here. And after the surgery, he was fine. But he was as fine, so he started to run. And he started to have symptoms again. So then I said, okay, so we have to fully fix it. Uh, so let's do this. Uh, this is his, again, uh, CT scan. So you can see that the payment really goes through the fibula. So the calcaneal bone is underneath the fibula. So with this alignment, anything I would do wouldn't fix the problem fully. So I qualified him for the subtalar fusion, uh, the subtalar joint when I when I prepare it for fusion. Uh, it's it's much bigger than people usually expect this joint to be. Uh, one trick that I usually do I, if I have problems and I want to actually uh, reach the anterior part of this of this joint, I put some type of uh, blunt trocar or whatever I have 
through the sinus tarsi. So I, I make another additional uh, incision. I put the uh, instruments through the sinus tarsi and I elevate them so I have more space in the subtalar joint and I can actually reach with my instruments the uh, anterior part of, of this joint. But in this patient, I also shifted the, the calcaneus. This is one of the uh, tools I really like. This is a step plate. It gives you a nice control uh, and they're, they're really nice tools and you can do it minimal invasive. So at the end, he had two screws, compression screws for the subtalar joint, plus he had this uh, step plate to uh, correct the alignment of the of the hind foot. And right now he's five years after the surgery. This is his range of motion. I'm showing it because uh, very often patients, they are expecting that if they have subtalar fusion, they will have loss of range of motion in the ankle joint. Not really the case. And this guy, he was second in national CrossFit championships. So he's doing really heavy work and he's athletic and he's, he's happy, he's fine. Um, uh, next case, if you have any questions in between, just, you know, tell me. Uh, TBL cyst, you mentioned about that before. Uh, so this patient is 28-year-old. Yes, yeah? Do you mind before we go on to the um, tibia, because uh, there were two questions here uh, concerning sure. the first two cases, if you don't mind, because I think it would be easier for so the patient yeah. to people of listen to the answers. First of all, Adam Al Hadidi, he asked about what's the name of the x ray that you um, uh, described for the impingement, the antromedial impingement? And uh, uh, it's, it's called AMI view, it's yes. anterior medial imaging. So the, the foot is a little bit shifted. It comes from, it was published first by Nick Van Dyke. If you send me an email, I can send you the whole paper about that. It's, uh, it comes from the fact that usually the osteophytes in the anterior compartment of the ankle are anterior medial. So when you do the true lateral view of the ankle, they can kind of hide uh, and you, you, you just cannot see it. Uh, yes. If we have time, I can show you the same patient, same ankle, lateral view and AMI view. And AMI view gives a lot of information. You don't need CT scan for that. You don't need MRI for that. It's just another, another projection. Simple, easy and very effective. Yes, the, the foot is actually externally rotated 30 yeah. degrees and the, 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 the viewer, the, the cassette of the x-ray is tilted from co uh, cephalic to caudad and then you take the view. One, one question about the case uh, which had a lot of soft tissue um, uh, uh, and impingements in it. Uh, this is from uh, Cadosa Bodo. He's asking, um, do you usually investigate ankles with either weight-bearing x-rays first and then an MRI prior to an arthroscopy, or do you just, um, from the x-ray, I think, go to the um, arthroscopy? And do these lesions show up on MRI scan? That's his question. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, I'm the type of surgeon who likes to have full diagnosis or as much as possible before I do the surgery. I'm pretty careful. Yes. So That's all my answer. patients, all my patients, they have weight-bearing uh, three projections, uh, ankle joint, x-rays and if it's um, uh, acute injury if I want to evaluate the ligaments I use ultrasound always but you need to have a good cooperation with radiologists and you need an experienced radiologist or to do it by yourself uh, and if I have a chronic case, if I expect to have some cartilage problems, if I expect that it's the beginning of degeneration whatsoever, I do also the MRI. Uh, but the trick is that even if you do all three of them, ultrasound, MRI, and x-ray, you are still missing a lot. I've tried to do arthro MRI. It's not always helping because very often there are some adhesions or scarring tissue so you cannot see everything very well so those little impingements like the one that i presented on the medial side i was not expecting that in the ultrasound it was described as some scarring tissue within the deltoid ligament and that's it so the diagnosis is basically made on clinical examination that you have pain on palpation. So expect you, you are expecting that there might be something in there. I, I think, in my opinion, we are lacking um, good diagnostic tools to actually objectively evaluate that. I don't, I don't know, Nasef, what's your opinion about that? 
Yes, absolutely. I think you're 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 exactly right there. Uh, uh, the MRI itself, there are different protocols and different. Uh, you can get a huge difference between a 1.5 Tesla machine and a 3 Tesla machine. Uh, the stir images they add, the fat suppression images. So it really depends on the exact um, clinical diagnosis that you have, and you should relay that to the um, radiologist because then they can do a specific. We think it's just one MRI of no. the foot or the ankle. Uh, they can then. Uh, do a specific software uh, which is in their system for that particular pathology or whatever. Um, okay, uh, you want to continue with your yeah, um, sure. cases? Uh, okay. okay, so the next case is a tibiosis. Uh, an eight-year-old male, he had a minor car accident. He complained of deep ankle pain, x-rays were normal, he started to have chronic pain, conservative treatment was not effective, and finally he had his MRI done. So what, what you can see here, uh, you can see some edema in the bone, and if you look closely, there is some cartilage breakage in here and the formation of the bone cyst in here. So when he presented to me, it was already a chronic case, so he wanted to do something about this. So I qualified him for the arthroscopy. Uh, this is a small uh, shaver. It's not a regular shaver. This is a small shaver, and it's really... At least for me, it was frustrating because it's not easy to get there. But if you do, uh, you, you can actually see the cartilage breakage and you know that the cyst is over there. So then I decided uh, to use this, this wonderful guide uh, and drill the cyst and clean it up. So you can see uh, I'm holding the guide. Uh, there, there is a camera inside, so on this C-arm, this is the camera, this is the uh, part of the guide, and this is the uh, K-wire uh, where I started to drill it. Pretty tricky because a lot of those cysts, they are not visible on x-ray. So C-arm, it's not helping you a lot in that. So you have to really think through the MRI images you had pre-op, and try to think where you should be, uh, plus you control it from the, uh, from the joint space. So uh, it's, a, it's a drill, I drill it, I put, um, uh, I put there, this is a quick set, so some filling, the one that you like to fulfill it, uh, plus at the end, uh, this is how it looks like in here, uh, plus, I, I usually try to put, this is a tissue call, this is a uh, uh, tissue glue that uh, resorbs naturally. So I just try to close the gate between the joint fluid and the, the cyst that I just drilled, okay? I just, I just want to isolate it. And this is the pa this patient is right now two years post-op. He has no complaints, and you can see that this edema that we had here uh, is disappeared. However, uh, maybe it looks nice during this presentation, but I, I usually have uh, some problems intraoperatively, technical problems. It's not rich to get there. It's not uh, easy uh, to to be in the right spot. Uh, so it, I, I think it's a complicated surgery. Maybe we should have more tools, better tools, but still with this guide, it's, it's much easier. Um, and then case four, ankle arthrodesis. Uh, majority of my ankle arthrodesis right now, I do arthroscopically, uh, both uh, superior ankle joint and subtalar joint. If I need to do both and there is no big deformation or there are no issues with the bone quality, I do it arthroscopically. I start with the posterior ankle arthroscopy and then uh, move it to the anterior ankle arthroscopy. I usually use three screws. Now, these are compression screws. Uh, right now, there are new screws that, uh, you know, they start to compress once you get through the line, which is pretty convenient. Uh, with the regular compression screws, you have to make sure that this part is below your line where you want to fuse it. Uh, I usually put uh, one screw from medial side, a second uh, screw from the lateral side, and the third one, smaller one, um, in the lateral compartment. 
Uh, so, uh, doing the ankle um, arthroscopy for an ankle arthrodesis um, has some uh, good things and bad things. Good thing is that you don't have to pay attention to the cartilage at all, which is uh, nice. But on the other hand, at the very beginning, this is what you see. Uh, you, you don't see much. And uh, a lot of those patients, they have scarring tissue. You cannot be sure about the anatomy. You cannot be sure uh, what extensor tendons are stuck to the tissues you are going to shave. So be careful with that. Uh, I like to uh, use burn. Uh, I always direct it towards the bone. Luckily, I don't have to pay attention to the cartilage. So I make a little space, little by little. I don't want to shave everything. I just want to find my place. And if you're patient enough, at the end, you have a lot of space. So you just clean it up. To some degree, you can also correct the alignment, but I wouldn't be too crazy about that. If there's a lot of to correct, I do a stotomy in the same time or do another procedure. Uh, and uh, I want to show you how it looks like on the x-rays. This is the 36-year-old male, four years after three malar fracture. He had chronic pain and uh, he had uh, arthrotic uh, changes, as you can see on this x-rays. So this is the immediately um, post-op. Uh, this is six weeks. This is five months. This is 21 months. So you can see that you have to actually wait a while to, f to see the, fu the full fusion. Of course, in the meantime, he started to walk normally. And to, to prove you that this is the same patient three months post-operatively, he just got out from the walker shoes. So he's still not secure with the way he's, uh, he's walking, uh, right foot. But if you look another patient, this is a female, and she's a year after arthrodesis. Oh, the, the, uh, the video goes a little bit crazy, sometimes fast, sometimes slow. But it's really hard to tell which leg was operated. And this is something that many patients are afraid of. And even some doctors are telling them, avoid arthrodesis as, as much as you can. Don't do this. You will be limping for whole, whole life. This woman, she's going for fitness. She's jumping. She's running. She's having a lot of fun. So uh, those patients, they really function well. Uh, and moving to the next case, calcanalysis. 21-year-old tennis player presented with uh, ankle instability and deep ankle pain. Uh, in his MRI, we saw this uh, bone cyst. Uh, some people, and in some papers, you can uh, find uh, theories that after an ankle sprain, there's a breakage within the subtalar joint, and the joint fluid starts to go into the calcaneal bone and starts to form this cyst. So this cyst can be also treated endoscopically. Uh, you can see this is the, uh, his foot, uh, uh, camera from one side and the instrument from the other side. So at the very beginning, if you put your scope into the bone cyst, it looks like that. Your goal is to clean it up from the soft tissue that are inside. And if you make a little hole on the other side of the uh, uh, bone. You can put different instruments, shavers, whatever, to clean it up and to kind of um, make all the walls of the cyst bleeding nicely. And then at the end, uh, I usually put some filler in. This is a quick set as well. Uh, the trick is not to allow too many of this quick set to leak out from the bone because it can give you some symptoms from the special lateral compartment, from the uh, um, peroneal tendons on the medial side, even from the nerve. So, so be careful with this. Uh, I'm sorry. My computer froze. I'll try to fix it if there are any questions. Obviously. Yes. Uh... Ursula, are you with me? You can hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so up until you get your, uh, oh, 
it it came back in to say thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, uh, the arthrodesis case, you have a lot of um, uh, people who are asking, especially about the configuration you use. Uh, you use one screw medially and two screws from the lateral side. Yeah. So let's ask this um, to to group the questions together. Is it necessary the second screw? Do you feel that you need that second screw? That's the first part of the question. And when you do put that screw, the second screw, where exactly on the fibula do you start it? And does it go to the tail okay. horizontally or not? Okay. So uh, I usually uh, uh, start with the medial screw. Uh, these are cannulated screws, so it's really nice. So you can put two wires first, and it will hold the position of the of the foot, which is really important for the arthrodesis. And the one from the medial side, I try... Uh, to put it from medial a little bit towards the posterior part of the talus. And the one from the lateral side, I wanted to cross the fibula, the tibia, and to end up in the anterior part of the talus. Uh, so they are kind of crossing because the fibula is usually a little bit more posterior in the uh, arthrotic uh, patients even more because sometimes the joint is subluxated a little bit and so on. So this one from the lateral side goes to the front. This one from the medial side goes to the back. I know there are different ways of putting those screws. I like it this way. I think it's more like a uh, a um, lot of points of stabilization. I over the last ten years, I only had two complications, and the patient, one patient, had delayed healing, and the other patient, I revised uh, for open stabilization. So I'm generally satisfied with that. The third screw, the one, the small one that I put from the fibula to the talus itself. Uh, to be honest. I rarely see diffusion in this area. I usually clean it. I try to make sure I clean all the soft tissues, not to have remaining symptoms from the lateral medial part of the ankle joint. But it's really rare where if I, the, to see an actual bone fusion in this area. Yes, uh, uh, that, that's a very good point you make there because um, uh, as you said, uh, I, I, when I'm doing the arthroscopic, I don't even spend too much time on the lateral side. I know that's not my main issue. I, I ma mainly go for the medium. Uh, just, just to finish up that part about the arthrodesis, uh, the configuration of the screws, when you are tightening the screws, do you go simultaneously? So medial, you tighten a bit, then you go lateral, tighten a bit, especially that they are crisscrossed like that, for fear of that when you tighten one side completely, there might be a little tilt on the talus when you're doing that. I think theoretically, yes, but to be honest, I don't pay attention to that. I've, I didn't notice any problems with that. I think that those okay. those joints, they're not that loose, uh, even if you clean it up. So I, I haven't, haven't seen those type of problems, but I usually do that. I put first two K wires, one on the lateral side, one on the medial side. Uh, I'm happy with the position of the foot. I check it several times. The other thing that I check, because once I had a problem with that, I always drape the patient so I can see the knee. Uh, okay. Because it happens to me with, with some amount of deformation in the ankle joint, the, the rotation of the foot, I, I was not fully happy with this one. So if you can actually see the knee, it's much easier uh, to evaluate the, the position of the foot. If you need, you can drape both legs and to compare it. I, I think it's, it's important. Okay, uh, excellent. So, um, Adham Al Hadidi, he also asked another question about the amount of the um, bone filler. In your case, I think it's quick set. Uh, how can you gauge the exact amount that you need to be injected because you don't really visualize the bone surface? So, how do you know this? I, I do. I have I have a scope inside, so I usually put an field. elevator to kind of close the yeah. because. First, I needed to drill it. So I have a hole coming to the joint. So when I have a scope in the joint, I can see this hole. And I'm trying to close it with any type of elevator or whatever works for you the best. Uh, plus, I have a C-arm. And all those, usually all the fillers, no matter what company, you can see it with the x-ray. So you have a double way of checking if you are, if you, if you are doing a good job. 
Yes, excellent. But I, I think Adham's question was related more to the um, superior, in this case, the superior side of the uh, tunnel that you have just drilled, the um, proximal part. Of I, I drilled this tunnel from the medial side. So on the medial part of the distal tibia, there is not too much tissue. You can actually mm -hmm. make a little incision and make sure that you are in the right spot. You can also use some uh, tools from drilling devices so you are not losing this filler to the soft tissue that are around exactly perfect perfect and um, going back to the uh, question to your aphoresis case you said that you I noticed that you use the um, uh, cautery device or the uh, vapor or whatever it's called uh, yeah. in your case uh, at the very beginning um, of your cases for the I think the arthrolysis uh, part before you get into the joint mm -hmm. um, is that um, your normal procedure? Do you have any fears when you're going in in this constrained joint with the? Um... I think it's I. In my opinion, it's safer than the shaver. I hate the idea that I have those anterior soft tissues stuck to the bone in the anterior compartment, and I'm not sure. So usually, I start with the blunt dissection, and I put in some elevator, trying to uh, deattach those soft tissues from the bone. But if I still cannot see much, I'm I'm really crazy about being careful. So if you put the uh, the burn inside and direct it towards the bone, uh, you're, you're pretty safe. I don't, I, I don't see how you could do more damage. But if you have a big shaver and those all those tissues are stuck to, to each other, be careful with suction because you can actually, I've seen it on the cadaver courses, people shaving the artery or the tendons. Yes. Um, Kadoza also is asking you another question about the... Um Case two. So he's asking which uh, portals were, would you use for the arthroscopic uh, subtalar fusion? And would it be possible to take a wedge from the calcaneus to correct the valvus rather than uh, the osteotomy? I, uh, I use the standard portals for the uh, posterior ankle arthroscopy. If I'm sure that I'm going only to the subtalar joint, I might put them a little bit more distally. Uh, and then the, the second part was? Uh, uh, you did a um, medial displacement osteotomy, I think. Uh, okay. Uh, so yes, that's... you could. But in this case, in my opinion, it was just too much to correct it intraoperatively with the uh, joint surface, especially that the joint surface didn't fully exist because the, it was a kind of a split fracture of the calcaneus. Yes. But maybe, you know, in better hands, it would work. W whatever works. You need to correct the alignment. Exactly. So the way you correct this alignment, so I thought I'll just shift the calcaneus because this is what have been shifted as a main cause of this problem. Okay. After the fracture, it shifted. So I kind of shifted back. Yes, and even if you do take a wedge, you're going to have to fix it anyway. So it would be better to fix it uh, uh, on a iatrogenic uh, proper cut than you would yeah. uh, a wedge. I think I think would. many people could argue that you didn't uh, need a step plate. You could, you know, do everything with two screws. Of course, you could, but. For me, I like things to be easy and um, I like to control what's going on during the surgery. So, it, of course, it's feasible. You can do this. But I would have a couple of points where it was a little bit unstable. So, shifting the calcaneal subtalar joint that was just, you know, a, a freed and with a lot of space. So, I yes, like it, it to make it shorter. Than... Yes. And... and to, to make it more predictable. And also, yes, the step plate, it gives you the exact gauge that you want to um, yeah. shift to the calcaneus to. I, so, I like this place. Yes. <laughs> Faisal is also um, asking you in uh, about, about I think, the same procedure, the um, arthrodesis, the subtalar arthrodesis. He said, is it necessary to start with the posterior ankle arthroscopy to do your arthrodesis? Um, Which arthrodesis uh, do you mean? I think, uh, I think he's asking about the subtalar arthrodesis. Subtalar antrodesis, I, I start with the posterior approach. I don't have to go to the superior ankle joint. It's yeah. not necessary, especially that in order to enter there, you have to shave a bunch of different ligaments, which in my opinion have some meaning. So, uh, but from the front, 
Yeah, it's pretty tricky. You can also do an open surgery and come from the lateral side, but in my opinion, posterior ankle arthroscopy uh, to the subtalar joint gives, gives you great visualization, great approach, great control, and it's, it's pretty easy. So, Ursula, let me ask you this question. And uh, actually, I think it's actually was uh, Faisal's uh, question also. He, uh, have you done the posterior ankle arthrodesis? So, ankle, not subtalar, from the posterior. Um, no. It has been for the past now, I think, three, four, five. I, I like things to be easy. So <laughs> I think anterior approach is much easier. I don't I don't like to. Of course, if I have to, I do. But I don't like too much to see a lot of tibialis posterior nerve. So if I can avoid it, I come from the front. Yes, that's a very logical answer. Uh, um, I think there are very, very rare cases that you would need to do. So it's not for a primary arthrodesis that you can normally fuse from the front. If you are going to have to need to do something also at the same time simultaneously from the back, then you might as well uh, do it. If you're doing it in conjunction with some other procedure on the front and you're afraid of your skin incisions, then you can save the front for that incision as a uh, high TP lostotomy in combination or whatever, and then go back. Uh, with the arthroscopy for the posterior ankle. Uh, besides, many of those patients, they have huge osteophytes in the anterior compartment. So I, I like to shave it off because I'm afraid that even if I fuse the ankle joint and they, they are going to have conflict of soft tissues on those osteophytes, uh, so it can be additional source of pain. I don't like it. I like my patients to be happy after the surgery. It's, it's good that you, you bring this up now. Uh, some people, I know some colleagues, especially in the United States, when they do the anterior ankle arthrodesis arthroscopically, they leave the osteophytes there and they fuse it and they think that it adds to the stability, uh, believe it or not, of the uh, ankle. That's what they say. So do you have any comments on that? Uh, I like to shave it off because of two things. First one, I'm afraid that, you know, uh, Picking osteophyte can cause symptoms when they put a shoe on or uh, or anything, you know, it can give conflict with soft tissue. And the other thing is that majority of those cases, they, they have some degree of deformation. So sometimes it's just impossible to correct this deformation without cutting off osteophytes. But if somebody is happy with it and his patients are happy, then it's okay, yeah? <laughs> I love that answer. Well, actually, I also had a different philosophy for that. I say I, I, I remove the osteophyte as much as it makes me do an adequate ankle athletes. I don't want the osteophyte to be impeding like a curtain and not making me see where I want to go. This is one point. And another point, as you so rightly said, if that osteophyte is going to be on the image uh, apparent and it's going to um, detract me or not make me know how to do my, uh, at the end, I want to correct arthrodesis posterior position of the talus right underneath the talus, underneath the tibia, and no uh, varus, especially rather than valgus. Yeah. And so if that osteophyte is going to detour me, I will definitely take it off and make sure that I have that correct alignment. So both for the arthroscopic visualization and also for later on compression. Um, okay, it's been wonderful, really, as usual. As, uh, it's awesome being with you, really, Ursula. I always learn a lot uh, every time. Just a Same little bit more every time. So um, if anyone else in the coffee room still has any more questions, if not, I think, uh, Mike, we should hand it over to you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Um, I don't see any additional questions on the email, and it looks like none on the chat box. So from our side, thank you both very much. It's been an absolute pleasure, and uh, we've enjoyed the session. Um, thank you both for your time, and uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you guys again. Um, thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, and, and thank you so much. Thank I'll you so you much. Thank, thank you. you. Take care, guys. All right. Bye. You too. Stay safe, everyone. Bye bye.